Prince. My name is Sam Fetter, and I'm a second year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to introduce this panel, Managing the Big League Leavers. Our panelists, starting from your left and closest to me, Damani Leach is Senior Vice President, Strategy and Business Development at the NFL. <laughs> Woo! Raphael Stone is General Counsel with the Houston Rockets and Minority Owner with Clutch Gaming. Evan Watch is Head of Basketball Strategy and Analytics with the NBA. Woo! Chris Greeley is Commissioner of North American LCS with Riot Games. And the panel will be moderated by Allison Overholt, Vice President and Editor-in-Chief with ESPN The Magazine, ESPNW, and the ESPYs. The panel runs 45 minutes with 10 minutes at the end dedicated to Q&A. We encourage you to participate in Q&A, and to do so, just tweet your question using the hashtag Big League Leavers. And with that, I'll turn it over to Allison. Fantastic. Thanks for being here this morning and coming out in the snow and everything. We really appreciate it. So we've got a fascinating conversation to have this morning, taking a look at this very unique ecosystem that surrounds pro sports. Um, you know, from a decision-making perspective, the fact that everything's so interconnected, that the landscape is constantly shifting, it creates a really interesting balance of power dynamic between all the entities in that world. So it gets really interesting to explore as you pull certain levers, you know, how do you even consider making changes to that system when you don't necessarily know when you begin exploring it that a change over here may have unintended repercussions over here. So in order to start talking about levers, why don't we start by defining that landscape a little bit um, in terms of outcomes. Everybody who's creating these systems, participating in these systems has a desired outcome. From where each of you sit, what are your big goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Want to start with, uh, with Chris? Sure. Um... So as you'll probably hear from some of the, the conventional sport folks, uh, we care about the same things that they do. Uh, we care about competitive integrity. We want to make sure that our teams are playing on an even playing field and that our fans, when they watch games, uh, have, the, have the feeling and understanding that the game is, is going to be fair. Uh, we care about player health, making sure that our, our rules, our formats, our schedule aren't, aren't burning guys out. We don't have the same... You know, we don't have to worry about a guy running up and down a court or up and down a field, uh, but there is a, a tremendous amount of fatigue when you're playing in those competitive environments, when you're on stage, uh, and when you're going through that. Uh, and then ultimately, we worry about our fans. We want to provide an entertaining product. Uh, we want something that they're tuning into. You know, we've heard a lot at this conference about uh, how we're all competing with not only each other, but alternate forms of entertainment. So, you know, Netflix and Sleep and Friends are all competitors of, of League of Legends and esports in general. So we want uh, a product where people are going to want to tune in um, that feels fair and doesn't wipe our players out. Yeah, we have literally the, the same list. Uh, so esports and, and the NBA aren't that different. Um, you know, the only thing I would add is as we think about um, our competitive landscape, it, there, there's the integrity piece, there's the balance piece. And for the NBA, as a sport where you know, one player can make such a difference, there's, there's the short-term balance and the long-term balance. So there's an idea that we may never be able to structure our league in a way that on opening night, 30 teams legitimately feel they can compete for a championship that season, but that if the system is set up properly, fan bases in any market over time think that their team has a reasonable chance to compete. So there's sort of that short-term, long-term tension, but otherwise our list, integrity, player health, and competitive entertainment would be exactly the same. Um, I'm coming at it from a team's perspective, so we want to win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we want to win, and then we want to win, and then we'd like to win some more. And I think the only thing that might slightly modify that is we'd like to do it while making money. Um, but generally, if you win enough, you make a lot of money. So we want to win. That's, yep. that's what we want. I'm probably closer to Evan and Chris in that for us, really in its simplest terms, for us it's about the game. And, and that's what creates fans. People are fans of this game. And, and we drive the business through engagement of those fans, but keep the game at the center. And if the game can be strong and there can be qual good quality football, that, that's what people are going to be fans of. And then we can leverage the engagement in order to drive the business. OK. So now that we know what each of you are thinking about when you get up in the morning, what you're focused on as your most positive outcome, um, let's talk about what happens when you consider introducing changes into the system. What does that process actually look like for you when you think about a change and how it might roll out into your ecosystem? Can you, uh, you know, Evan, I'm going to ask to start with you because you described it as a butterfly effect, and I'd love for us to just start there. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's funny. I thought about this for years, and I think 
you can look back at the history of the NBA and see a bunch of the changes in how they've um, flowed through the system and had maybe not unintended, but certainly a lot of downstream consequences that you may not have thought of. Everything from the, you know, there's Kirk gave a presentation yesterday on the narrowing of the key, um, you know, based on George Mikan and Will Chamberlain, or sorry, the, the widening of the key. Um, you know, the introduction of the three-point shot, some of the changes around illegal defense and defensive three-second, things that were designed to change the game at points where it had maybe gotten a little stagnant, and, and it fundamentally changes who plays in the league, the, the types of players teams are going after. So um, looking to solve these small issues, you end up with, with really big changes, and, and our process is, is really robust now. So we've got, uh, we've got a competition committee, which is comprised of owners, coaches, general managers, players, and referees. Um, and they meet frequently throughout the season and then in the off season to think about how does the game look, what's happening in the, the landscape of competition, uh, what, we, what might we want to consider changing. And then they make recommendations through our board of governors. Um, if there's implications for the players union, we'll negotiate with them as well. A lot of times we're partnering with our media, our networks as well, uh, especially as it relates to the broadcast of the game and you know, things like game flow and, and the timeout structure. So it's a, a fairly layered decision making process. Um, but one that we think is robust and leads to pretty good outcomes because ultimately you're getting all those perspectives in the room to understand what might happen if we were to do X or Y. Um, and I think there's been a lot of cases where we've made changes and the outcome has been what we in, it did expect in other cases where you say, actually, this unintended consequence happened, maybe we need to revisit that uh, and see if we can tweak the, the change in some way. Now, Damani, is it as layered in the NFL? I mean, you guys are currently working through proposed changes to yeah, the replay review yeah. process. I'd, I'd say the, the process is pretty similar, um, and the process is, I think, quite clear. It's just not very easy, um, quite honestly. Uh, there are an enormous number of inputs that happen throughout the season from coaches and players and media and staff, the commissioner. Everyone has thoughts about the game and what, what needs to be done to improve the game, um, and that works itself through the off season to where we are now, um, getting much more formal feedback from coaches subcommittee, general managers, um, lots of other proposals directly from clubs, and that, that all gets filtered through the competition committee, and then they make proposals ultimately to owners at the end of this month. Wow, so what's the typical time frame for any given change, like what's happening with replay review? Yeah, um, so some of it's gonna depend on sort of the urgency of it. I think health and safety matters certainly will take on a greater sense of urgency. Other things can take much longer. We don't, we don't have a minor league. We don't um, have much of a preseason. In that preseason, quite honestly, people are trying to get ready. People are competing for jobs. So there's not a lot of room for experimentation and testing. And, and so sometimes that can delay the implementation of things. We'll, we'll work on something for over the course of a year or two years before we feel like it's ready to be proposed. Gotcha. Now, Chris, you said something really interesting yesterday when we talked um, around how, in your case, you've got an entire competitive structure that's layered on top of a game that exists independently from you. Can you describe what that's like for everyone? Because that's so unique compared with what everybody else is dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, League of Legends is a, it's a PC game. It's the most popular, uh, most played uh, PC game in the world. We've got last public report was something like 100 million active monthly users uh, across the world. That game is changed every two weeks. So we're on a regular patch schedule. Sometimes those patches are large and sometimes they're small, but they happen with you know, precision-like regularity. Uh, and those, we don't, uh, on the competitive side, on the esports side, whether it's the league in North America or our, our league in China or one of our other 11 leagues across the world, we have regular conversations with the people who are actually developing the game. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the changes they make are, are their call. So the, the best analogy uh, is if there was a, someone that ran basketball, not the NBA, but basketball as a game, uh, and every two weeks they just made a slight tweak. So they'll change the weight of the basketball, they'll change where the three-point line is, they'll change where the free throw line is, they'll change potentially the number of people on the court, and the fine folks at the NBA just have to deal with that and talk to their teams about it and then write rules against what happens. So. Uh, sometimes those changes are relatively minor and, and very welcomed by our pros. Uh, and our, our gameplay folks do have a, a pretty good pipeline of uh, conversations with professional players all over the world to say, hey, we're thinking about doing a thing. Uh, can you tell us your thoughts on it? You know, we try to, try to suss out some of those unintended consequences early uh, from the people who have subject matter expertise and play the game you know, 12 to 16 hours a day. Uh, but ultimately, we worry about, uh, on the league side, 
the rules that, that structure and govern the league uh, while also trying to somehow mitigate uh, gameplay changes. Yeah. How do you even get to a place where you can be strategic from a lead, league perspective as opposed to just like reacting on that two-week cycle? I mean, it's so different from what these guys are talking about with considering what every small tweak to rules might do throughout the game. Yeah, we have, for, for larger changes, uh, we've gotten much better at having uh, pretty robust conversations before those go into effect. Uh, we've had some pretty bad missteps in the past when we didn't have those communications and when we weren't communicating those to teams. Uh, and we've gotten much better at not dropping those giant changes in the middle of a season. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, uh, back in 2016, there was a major change made uh, that affected the way every team across the world played the game. And some teams that were really good all of a sudden became really bad. Uh, and it was going into our largest tournament of the year, which is our, our world's tournament, uh, which you know, has a multi-million dollar prize pool this year. We had 100 million people watching like nearly Super Bowl numbers, although that's, you know, Super Bowl is generally just in the U.S. and we're, we're spanning the world, uh, so not really apples to apples. But uh, So those changes have a, have a huge rippling impact across. So we, from a rules perspective, usually have a heads up that things are coming and can have conversations with teams and get something in place. But a lot of times the gameplay changes, um, you know, what items are in the game or, or what interactions happen in the game, don't have a tremendous impact on the rules. They just have a tremendous impact on the gameplay and what, you know, as, with, as we heard before, right, what players are in the league and, and what those players can do. It, it starts to change that landscape. Yeah. So, Rafael, what is it like for you? You sit across both of these worlds. What does this feel like to you to kind of toggle between these mindsets? Um, I don't know. I guess I don't, I don't think about it a ton. Like, yeah. But they're very different is what I would say. I mean, like... Well, the first thing is, is, is that like my job is the Houston Rockets. Right. So like that's my livelihood. That's how my kids eat. So, 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 so definitely in terms, you know, poor Evan, like it, it's like in terms of, you know, <laughs> how much I care, it's, 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 it's pretty disproportionate. Um, but, and I don't, and you know, I've spent 40 years, 40 plus years with basketball, um, you know, being an enormous part of my life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I never heard of League of Legends until two years ago. So, so they're, 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 they're really different. I will say the interesting thing is just how much more complicated League of Legends is than basketball. Like, I, yeah, it's, it's like, it's just insane. Like, yeah, to his point, the rules aren't the same. The drivers aren't the same. Uh, the best players, depending upon the patch, can, you can go from best to worst in like a week. It's, it, there's just some real, you know, there's some, there's, it's, it's just an, it's, it's an extraordinarily different sport and, and, it's, and it's super hard to get your arms around. Uh, it's definitely still a sport and it's really, really interesting. Um, but for me, it's, it's maybe a little bit more frustrating because, be, because we've been doing basketball so long and because we've, you know, there are certain things, right? Like, I won't talk about other teams' players, but it won't shock anybody that if you have James Harden on your team, you're going to be really good. <laughs> like, you know, I could, if, I, if I start with James, I'm feeling great about life. And, and, and there's nothing as simple as that in League of Legends, at least nothing that, that we've, as a group, discovered. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's you know, it's... It's, it's, it is very different, and thus far, at least slightly frustrating because you want to be good at things, and uh, you know, and, and, and like I said at the very introduction, you, you all, our goal is to win, and in order to win consistently, you have to understand, in a, you know, in a very kind of detailed level what impacts winning, and while I think that we, we largely have that in basketball, as a, as a group that works together, we are, we're still working towards it with League of Legends. So that's, yeah. when I think about the two, that's kind of, that, that, that's the biggest difference. Nice, so let's dig into that a little bit more, the, the piece that gets to balance of power issues. So, Raphael, you said yesterday, like a little bit tongue in cheek, but it was very funny. You said, you know, there's some truth to the old adage that, you know, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Um, tell us what you meant by that. I mean, it was lighthearted, it was funny, no, no drama in the room here. Just joking. Um, no. Right, right. No, I mean, what, well, what, tell what, us about that. Yeah, we were talking, we, it came up in the context of talking about rules and rules changes and, and, and various levers that you might, that, that, you, that leagues might use. And, and I was saying that one of the important things when you're, when you're contemplating these changes is that they have to be things you can enforce. Right, so there's a yeah. difference between a, a rule that is that that is well. Actually, there is no difference. Like one example is if you put in a rule that the referees can't referee correctly, then it's not a rule, right? And and but it, 
off the field, you know, if you're saying, well, we think it'd be much better if people only spoke in whispers, but you can't hear everybody, and then so one team, everybody's then gonna shout if there's a competitive advantage to shouting, because I think almost by definition, the people who end up, for sure the players, right? Like, in order to be a professional athlete, and honestly, it doesn't matter what the sport is, by definition, you're gonna be one of the most competitive people in the world. And, and, and at least my experience has been that that drives across organizations and that what you find in the front office are people who are equally as competitive, they're just like fat and short like me, right? And so, <laughs> so you've got all these people that are just ridiculously competitive and, 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 and breaking rules is not a criminal act, at least generally. And so if, if the league isn't in a position to enforce them, then people are gonna go right up to the line and then they're gonna leap over it if there, if there are no real consequences. And so I think from the league's perspective, one of the things that they have to do that's important is figure out both how they'd like to change things and then how to make sure that they're able to change things and make sure that that's spread out equally because um, you know, because otherwise it's, you know, it, it doesn't work. And I, I just yeah, say that. I wanted to hear your take on this. <laughs> Um, where to start? So there, there's, there's, there's two buckets here, right? There's, to me, in what Rafael's talking about, there's on court and there's off court. So we have a set of rules for how the game should be played on the court. Players often try to push the boundaries of those rules and potentially exploit those rules in a way that is difficult for our officials to officiate. I don't see that as rule breaking. I see that as sort of trying to gain competitive advantage within the flow of the game. And if they're, you know, take traveling, for example, something we obviously get a lot of flack for. There's a lot of instances in a game where a player's pivot foot might move six inches or they lift the pivot foot just before they start the dribble, which are technically traveling violations. And to Rafael's point, those are almost impossible to see by a referee in real time, right? We can see it after the game when you slow the game down and don't go frame by frame. I'm not saying that that's a player cheating or trying to gain an unfair advantage, right? That's, that's a player playing within the rules and it's the referee's job to try to call it as accurately as possible and we help train the referees to do that. That's different than manipulating the rules off court. You know, if it's a, if it's a CBA rule or a, a league rule around how teams communicate with each other, how trades are constructed or how franchises are built, like there, it does get into an element of threatening the integrity of the competition, which I see is very, very different than within a game context, maybe getting away with a, a play that's against the, the playing rules. And, I mean, Do you observe it, these same dynamics in the NFL? Very, very similar, and, and it's really, it's about sort of what the nature of the league is, like what, what's the purpose of this league, right? It's a, it's a collection of teams, of clubs that have all decided to play under a certain set of rules and compete within those rules, and, and really it's the league's responsibility to decide what are the rules or the standards within which we want to compete, and then what are the things outside of those where we say go for it, right? We, we're not regulating how big somebody's locker room is or how many weights are in their weight room. Those are areas where they say, go for it, let a thousand flowers bloom. But there are certain areas where we say, you know, coach to player communication, we're gonna limit the amount of time within which, you know, that can happen before each snap. And it's just, that's agreed upon by everybody where they wanna compete and, and where they want some, some more rigorous standards in place. Mm -hmm. So Chris, you had mentioned briefly at the top um, this very strong sense that your players have of wanting to know that they got a fair shake. How does that play out in your role? Like, how, what do you need to do to ensure that that's happening? Because to the point in these other leagues, it's like you're looking for whatever your advantage is, and if the players can, you know, get a, a leg up, they they get it. That's great. There feels like it's more about maintaining the system versus like, hey, let's make sure that our players feel like everything's fair. Yeah, we have um, we have kind of the unique situation that our players aren't using their their physical abilities to compete against one another. So when you are scouting the Rockets and you're gonna go play the Rockets, right? You watch thousands of hours of James Harden and you figure out, all right, you know, here's when he goes left and here's when he goes right and here's where he shoots and here's where he passes. Uh, when you're scouting a team you're gonna play in League of Legends, you're worried, what champion are they gonna pick in the game? Um, it's 141 of them now. So you know what they generally play, but you know, they may be practicing something you've never seen. They may have found something that, you know, three patches ago that no one noticed, like a, a a certain composition of five champions got really powerful together because they synergize well. And when you buy certain items and you, you, set, you set your team up in a certain way, uh, it's, it's simply really difficult to counter. Uh, so there's a lot of like, strategy elements that come through. Um, the way we try to maintain that is through game balance. So we have a game balance team that, that works, we always call it the other side of the street. They're not with eSports, they sit with uh, core gameplay development. 
uh, and it's their job to try to find this stuff before the pros do, but like most things, it's an arms race. So we'll, we'll realize that there is a strategy and try to patch it out of the game if we think it's bad for either competitive integrity or entertainment value, but if pro players find it before we do, then we learn about it at the same time as our fans when it shows up on stage and on broadcast. Uh, we also have the um, kind of in the unique position that we have 13 leagues across the world. So, uh, and those leagues, we're basically playing every single day of the week if you look at, at different leagues. Uh, so you'll see, whereas our teams in North America may not find something, you know, you'll turn on the Korean broadcast at two in the morning if you're sitting on the West Coast, uh, and all of a sudden they break out a strategy and everyone goes, oh my God, how did no one see that? Uh, and then immediately everyone starts practicing it and you start to see it ripple through. And then we start having long conversations with the gameplay folks on, is this intended? Is this good for the game? Is this something that you guys are going to leave in or remove? Like, what can we, what can we tell teams? Yeah. So it's a, very much an arms race, very much a, a, everyone is out seeking that competitive advantage, but they have a lot more variables and levers to pull. Fascinating. All right, so let's, let's talk case study for a second with NBA and NFLs. Draft, draft lottery stuff. Um, you know, in the NFL, draft order determined purely by ranking. You know, in one sense fair, in another sense, does it incentivize tanking? Now, there's a package of changes that got introduced in the NBA specifically to address that lottery system. Um, Evan, you talked about how that package of changes actually got put into place over the course of, you know, number of years from 2014 to 2017. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, and uh, I think one of the comments earlier, like how quickly these things happen. Um, we've tweaked our draft lottery, I think, Adam's counted six times since it was instituted in 1985. So you're, you're constantly reacting to team behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the lottery has gone from equally weighted lotteries to you know, smooth curves to steep curves and all of it to try to balance this notion of a draft, which is to allocate talent to struggling teams with the competitive integrity and ensuring that teams feel incentivized to compete every night. And so I think what we started to look at you know, about five, six years ago was that maybe we had tilted too far to the place where the incentives were skewed towards teams saying, I'm going to pursue draft picks over competing. Um, and from the league perspective, to, to the point about the rules and how they get applied off court and on court, we have no issue with teams looking to rebuild. It's, it's fundamentally important to get young players playing time to see how they're going to perform and plan for the future of your franchise. Where it flips into a potential integrity issue is when the team has incentive to take that to an extreme, specifically to accumulate losses and, and get a higher draft pick. Uh, and then even worse, fans then rooting against their own team, right? And so what we ended up doing after a few iterations of potential reform was instituting the, the new draft lottery that kicks in this year, whereby the, the, top, the, the, top, the bottom three teams all end up with the same odds of winning the draft lottery at 14%. Uh, and I think where you're already seeing impact, and it's too early to declare victory on that change, but you look at actually just the last couple nights, right? We've had uh, some incredibly competitive games between some of our, our bottom tier teams. So uh, Atlanta and Chicago playing a quadruple overtime game last night. Um, New York and Cleveland a couple nights ago, really close game. And maybe last year, had you seen that, you would have seen fans um, complaining essentially that their teams won those games and cost themselves up to 5% in the lottery without too much benefit from that win. Right? And this year you say, actually, those teams are going to have approximately 14% odds no matter where they finish in that bunch. Mm -hmm. So let's root for them to win. Let's, let's see that, that competitive integrity play out. So I think we're seeing some benefit in terms of that race to the bottom. But again, the, the long term is yet to be seen. But it was a great example of where our teams got ahead of us on what seemed to be a, a sound analytical strategy. Now, you could debate the qualitative aspects of that strategy and whether it actually is in the long term best interest of a franchise. But it almost doesn't matter if you've got teams pursuing it and it's, it's threatening that integrity piece. So if the outcome seems so clearly positive with the changes you're implementing, why did it take a number of years to be able to implement? What did that process look yeah, like? Yes, so I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily so clearly positive. Again, it's way too early to say what the long-term impact will be. Uh, I think that the flip side of this argument is you look at some teams that said, it is really, really difficult to build a contending team in our league, uh, a championship contending team, uh, especially if you're viewed as a team or a market in some cases that doesn't think it's going to be able to attract uh, top tier free agents, mm -hmm. and are, obviously we're a star driven league. Now, we have tons of examples of stars going to small markets, either through trade or free agency, but there is that perception among some teams that that's a challenge, and, and we understand that. And so they look at the draft as one of the most important ways to build a franchise, and so they said, if you are taking away this one tool I have to build my franchise, which is to go get those top picks where typically a lot of our stars are drafted, you're really tilting the playing field even further in favor of teams that maybe are free agent destinations. Um, 
And so that was the tension that was playing out and, and ultimately why it took a little longer to get to a place where we could compromise with a system that we hope will balance those two things. Raphael, what do you think when you listen to all this? Yeah, I mean, this one is like, it's fine. Like, you know, I, I don't, I, 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 you know, I think my, my take is that, that there are, yeah, there's enough examples. I do think that market size matters and markets matter, right? Um, and I think that there are some, you know, just, it's not terribly different if you're an NBA player or if you're a lawyer. There are some cities one might prefer to live in, but fundamentally the job is the biggest driver. Right? So that would be my argument to, to people who, who, who live in different markets is, yeah, you're not starting from a completely even playing field, but at least in my personal opinion, it's definitely the case that if you put together a great organization that is really you know, doing interesting things, people want to be a part of that, right? And that will overcome uh, warm weather, right? And so I think, and I think that that's largely played out. Um, I, yeah, so I think from our perspective, we might, we might want to see something, I, I might, I, I shouldn't say we, I might want to see something completely even and, and just bet that, that, again, you know, I'm pretty competitive, like, and just bet that, that I'll do a better job. So the, the more even the playing field, the, more, the less randomness, the better. Uh, and, and the lottery is, the draft lottery is the exact opposite, right? It, 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 it does say for those who weren't as successful this year, it gives them a, it gives them an advantage going into next year. So I might prefer, I don't know, Mike's wheel or what, whatever else. Doesn't matter. Um, but having said that, it's not. I, I I completely and totally understand kind of ownership perspective on this, and I think it, I honestly think it's fine. This this is not for me. A, we have plenty of fights. This is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pivot to one of those. Maybe we were talking a little bit yesterday about trade loopholes. Talk to us about the, the trade loophole that you explored last season. The what? Sorry. Um, this oh, is for Raphael, yeah. Really? No, so when, when, these, yeah, when, you, when these guys are putting together rules, like especially, we, you guys don't have a CBA yet, but, but these guys have collective bargaining agreements with, with players. And so when they're, when they're putting together the rules, it's not like they can just write perfect rules in a vacuum. They have to collectively bargain them and they have to negotiate them with somebody else who maybe doesn't have all the same incentives. Um, it's very hard, at just speaking as a lawyer, it's very hard to write something perfectly even if you're doing it by yourself, right? Like, so in other words, like you want something to mean this and it can't possibly be interpreted to mean something else. That is actually challenging. It's extraordinarily challenging when you're trying to do that in a negotiation like extraordinarily challenging to the point of being impossible. And so, so when we get a CBA or something, one of the things we do is we immediately start looking at things that we think we can take advantage of. That is literally a big part of my job. And we got guys, we have Eli, we've got Monty, we've got Fan Hall. These guys are much smarter than me, much smarter than anybody at the league, no offense. They're gonna find the loopholes, right? And so, uh, they are. They're just, they're going to find it. And we found an interesting one. The, the most interesting one we found, we didn't use, and it doesn't exist anymore, so I can talk about it. Um, th there, was, there was a rule that, that was written such that, it, that uh, it, and, and, the, and the CBA, where, where you, could, um, you could wave and stretch a player, and there was nothing that said you couldn't then re-sign him. And so one of the things that we were thinking about doing was if you think about, the, if you think about a contract, let's say, that, let's say you sign a guy to a, who's worth $10 million to a $10 million contract. Um, that's a fair contract. You can now trade him hopefully for nothing because he's worth $10 million. So somebody else says, yeah, I'll pay him $10 million. But it's hard to get like a really good thing back unless somebody thinks he's worth more than $10 million. So the idea behind this one was, okay, so we'll sign this guy to a $10 million deal, um, which is costing us 10, but then we'll give him, an, you know, then we'll wave and stretch him. So he, we're still giving him the $10 million, but over time, and then we'll re-sign him to a million dollars over the same amount of time, right? And so now I've got a guy under contract who's worth 10 million, but I'm only paying him a million, so I've got this great contract asset. So that was one of the things that we thought about doing. And the league actually found the loophole uh, and, and 
and agreed with the Players Association to change it, but that change didn't go into effect until July 1st, and we found it in January or what, it doesn't matter the date, right? And so we had some discussions about doing that. That was really fun, and, and the league's position was, no, 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 the loophole doesn't exist, and so you can't do that. We won't let you do that. And I was like, of course it exists. You closed it. By definition, <laughs> it exists. And it, that was, so that, but that's our job, right? Like, and, and that's the, that's, that's the push-pull, is my job is to try and do these things to create adva competitive advantages, and, uh, and then the league gets to decide if they think that we're allowed to do it or not. Or in this case, they actually wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to decide. Anything collectively bargained, the league doesn't decide independently. You'd have to arbit It would have been a big fight. It wasn't worth it. But, I mean, this is fascinating. Yeah. I got to ask, why didn't you use this? Ah, uh, we did something else, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so that's for next year's panel. We'll get to you that. You can't do it anymore. So it's a, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about how you guys all learn from each other. I thought it was really interesting to hear that, you know, Damani and Evan, you, you guys actually talk to each other pretty frequently. You yep. know, you're counterparts of each other in, in your respective leagues. Um, at the top of the panel, Damani, when you were talking about the NFL's sort of laser focus on quality of the game, yeah. um, can you talk to us a little bit about the football quality index, what yep. that means, and yep. then we'll kick over to Evan, and I'd love to hear, you know, why you're thinking about, you know, wanting to maybe replicate something like that for the NBA. Yeah, and, and it even sort of picks up a little bit in the way that Evan was talking about games recently and how, you know, a couple, a couple nights ago there were some great games, and he used some descriptors of those based on the closeness of the games and whether or not there were overtimes, and we have, we have similar conversations in our office Games are played every weekend. We all watch them and have different interpretations about the quality of that game and whether or not the football was actually any good. And so a couple of years ago, we undertook a process of trying to really put some numbers behind that and say, okay, um, what if we were able to create a number, a metric that effectively graded every single NFL football game? And it, it took into account in really big chunks the, the competitiveness of the game, um, the quality of the officiating, the pace of the game, um, how the players behaved in certain terms of player conduct, um, and then also player health and safety, the injuries, and all the different variables that, that go into that. And there's about 25 of them in that index. And you've got to go through a process of deciding which ones are more important than the other. And ultimately, it's an algorithm that um, somebody figured out that's not me. It's a lot smarter than I am. Um, but fortunately, the league. what's that? They must not work at the league. They, yeah. No, no, we have smart people I, at the league. I'm not as smart. It's others. <laughs> <laughs> But it, um, you know, it, was, it was a really good and interesting process, and it's one that now we share with our executives um, on a weekly basis during the season to give them a good sense of how that weekend went, how that compared to the same weekend um, of the last five years, what were some of our highest rated games, what were some of the games that struggled in certain windows, how we do on Sunday night football, Monday night football, um, all of those things. You know, For many years, ratings was a proxy for that, but that's really not fair because ratings, as you know, are driven by things like who's playing in the game, what teams are playing in the game, what window it's in. So ratings really aren't a very good um, indicator of the overall quality of the game. So that's a, a project we've been working on, shared that with Evan. I don't know if you guys Yeah, and we, we are, absolutely. So, so we're really just at the beginning stages of studying this, and I think um, there's, there's tremendous value in being able to talk about the quality of your game. Uh, we have a, a very frequent talking point that you'll hear, which is the game's never been better. Um, we've yeah. been saying that for years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's probably true. I think we all <laughs> fundamentally believe that, but I can't say why that's the case or how to prove that. And so part of it is to be able to um, back up some of these assertions or feelings we have about what we're seeing. Um, but, but more importantly for us, I think it's about the ability to track over time uh, the impact of, of these changes that we make, right? Because to your question before on draft lottery, it's very easy for me to sit here and say, yeah, it worked, everyone's competing. Um, but if the fans aren't engaging with the product and if the product doesn't look better as a result and I can't prove that, then that's just a, a conjecture, right? And so what we're trying to do is say all of the components that will go into you know, our quality score would be some of those same things around the, the flow of the game, uh, the competitiveness, how close it was back and forth, the quality of the offense, the quality of the defense, et cetera. And so as we tweak things, hopefully we see that, that average score rising over time to say, we're actually achieving the things we want to achieve. Now, the score in and of, in and of itself is subjective because you're mm -hmm. deciding what metrics to put into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But if you can get agreement from your constituents, from your, your teams, from the league office, from our media partners, from our fans, what components they like, and you can actually kind of use ratings as a yep. backwards proxy, right? So if you sort of regress historical games against ratings and look at which variables tended to drive ratings beyond things like which teams are playing and which yep. windows it's in, because those are, those are exogenous in some sense, um, then you can start to identify what actually do we want to accomplish 
and put those things into the score and try to track them over time. So we think it would be an, an interesting way, and again, we're just at the early stages, but hope to use this over time to measure and, and be able to prove that the game has never been better. So what are some of the things that each of you, you know, put into as variables into that score? And then to your point about measuring that change over time, if it's an evolving algorithm and you're sort of saying like, hey, over time we've learned that, you know, this is weighted too heavily and is maybe skewing how we see this, how can you measure consistently you know, whether the quality of the game is rising or falling if that algorithm actually has to change and evolve itself? Yeah, the hope would be not to change the algorithm. Right? Like you want as much consistency as possible. Now, like yes, you might have to add or subtract things over time, and you can go back and do pro formas. But um, again, we're we we want to we're just starting to to test it, and we want to learn from our teams what they want to see in it. So, um, but it, it would be a mix of the things I said, right? So like for us, game flow is a big issue. So things like the number of stoppages in the game, the number of uh, free throws, and we certainly are not encouraging referees not to blow whistles, but we know that. Uh, free throws detract from competitive enjoyment of the game. Um, so those types of things, bringing in uh, the minutes played by stars, for example, as, as a proxy for how healthy our players are. Are they, are they on the court? Um, are we you know, properly scheduling the games to, to prevent injuries, things like that? Um, we'll look at quality of offense by measures of shooting efficiency or number of passes. We'll look at quality of defense by how effectively teams are contesting shots to try to make sure we're balanced. So it's, it's, we probably have the same thing, close to 25 things we've kicked around, and, and what will end up in that final soup, I think, is... is yeah, we actually, we actually change ours quite a bit because we're still building it, and we just kind of keep iterating and keep iterating. Um, you know, probably a couple good examples of that. One is around time. Like, we started out, or, or margin, we'll say margin of victory. We started out by saying margin of victory is important. How close was the game? Um, and as everybody knows, that changes throughout the game. So then we moved to a metric um, where it was really about the average score differential on a per play basis, and then track that through the course of the game as opposed to just margin of victory, which is just the score at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. um, so you start doing that and get more and more um, nuanced with it. Um, so doing that, trying to do the same thing with injuries right now is another one. So you know, you talking about stars was reminded me of that. And we're, we're working on that now. You know, Raphael's a much better football player than I am. If we both have the same injury and out the same amount of time, do we want to weight those equally? No. I mean, he's the starting quarterback and I'm the, you know, third string guard. Um, his injury is much more impactful than mine. And so trying to build a metric around that as well. So just keep iterating, keep getting more refined with it. Fascinating. So um, I also wanted to make sure we talked a little bit about your next gen stats example yeah. in terms of you know how you're using data and analytics to drive decision making. That sounded really interesting because it was a it was a different process than what we've heard described so far. A lot of this has been at the league level, um, you know, making data driven decisions. In this case, you're actually pushing that experience of. Um, working through all of the, that feedback, the data feedback, um, to football operations and then bringing that up to the league level. Yeah, so, so for, for those of you who don't know, we have um, RFID chips on players and it, it tracks their location 10 to 12 times per second throughout the game. And, and, it, and it, it started as, as sort of a media play for us, really. Let's gather this data as another new and different data insight to share with our media partners so they could help tell stories about the game. Um, we gave teams their own data um, so they could use it primarily for health and safety player performance uh, purposes. But very quickly, two things happened. Uh, one, I think our football team started seeing that data reported in the media and said, well, wait a minute, why does ESPN have that data? And we don't. Um, but also, on the other hand, they were a little bit concerned that I'm not sure I want the other teams having my, my data as well. And so we went through um, about a six to nine month process where we got, we worked with a lot of former coaches uh, and general managers um, during the season to get feedback from them. And we basically told them, hey, act as if you were still a head coach and a GM. We're going to give you this data. We're going to pair you with some data scientists. Act as if you were a GM or head coach. How would you use the data? What are the strengths of it? What are the limitations? What concerns you about it? Um, and use that information to inform the competition committee, who ultimately last year decided, yeah, let's go ahead and release the data, give it to all 32 clubs, historically as well as on a weekly basis during the season. So one of the things that really strikes me hearing all of you describe all of these different levers is that as data-driven as this evaluation process is and all these different dimensions, the implementation process is very human. Um, yeah. You know, there's this, 
this aspect of you know the constant negotiation and consensus building and you know ultimately compromise to the process that sounds a lot more like what it takes to get a bill through Congress yeah. than what we might typically imagine to be very cut and dry data driven decisions. Do you each have a sort of philosophy and perspective as we start to wrap up here on how you think about the role of data and analytics in your decision making processes? You can just roll right on down. Sure. Um, we wind up, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> we collect, uh, we're looking at data on two levels. So we've got game data, um, you know, our player metrics that, that flow down, except I don't need to, to chip a player. Everything is digital. It flows through an API. And like at the end of the day, League of Legends is just a giant math problem um, with a video game put over it, right? You have a certain amount of health. I have a certain amount of health. We're, we're using abilities that take away health from someone else, right? You're just trying to eventually go through and, and win a game. Um, but what we're, what we're spending a lot of time looking at in terms of data and analytics is, uh, is all business side stuff for the league. Um, we're looking at our viewership. We're looking at where those viewers come from, whether they're um, in North America, whether they're international. We have no real boundaries for our broadcast. They're all digital. They're pumped out constantly. So we're trying to drill down uh, and understand who's watching, where they're coming from, um, who's, who's uh, separately, who's playing League of Legends and watching or not watching. Um, why are they watching if they are watching? So we can encourage more people to watch. And if you're not watching, why not? Um, you play the game, you, you, you know, if you're a golfer, you, you may watch golf on TV, right? Because it teaches you, um, th you get to not only watch performance at the highest level, but there's some educational aspect to it as well. You see a way a professional golfer does something. It's something that you may want to replicate. We've got the exact same thing. If you're a League of Legends player and you want to get better and you want to appreciate play at the highest level, um, you watch pro play. So we, we dig through our data and analytics to uh, try to answer those basic viewership questions uh, to inform our partners and sponsors. Uh, and then uh, we're starting to work with teams to understand uh, kind of a little bit more about player health, um, what those guys are doing in terms of regular schedules, regular practices, their scrimmages, um, what teams are doing to help support them, uh, and how we can kind of use all those things to you know, help develop better practice tools, right? Where if you want to practice free throws in the NBA, you grab a basketball, go out to the court, and you just shoot free throws until you're tired of it and you stop. Uh, if you want to practice something as a pro player in, a League of, in League of Legends, you most likely get nine other people to sit down and play a 40-minute game so that you can practice one specific aspect. Um, we have the ability to build tools that sit on top of the game to, to better facilitate practice and try to lower that grind for players and the toll that it takes on them. So we're trying to work through some of that data as well so we can answer those questions. Yeah, I, I think for us it's very situationally dependent. Um, so there, I see my role as trying to provide context to decision making. And a lot of times the data provides that context. Um, the data doesn't make the decision for you. I know a bit of a cliche, but um, for example, several years ago when we made our, our changes to the, the timeout structure in the league, uh, a lot of that was based on some dial testing we had done where we had fans watch games and they could turn the dial up at parts they enjoyed and down at parts they didn't, uh, kind of like a political debate. And what we found, not surprisingly, is that fans don't like stoppages. They don't like timeouts. They don't like instant replay. They don't like free throws. Um, and so we targeted the areas that we thought would have the most impact on fan enjoyment by using that dial testing data. Right? The dial testing didn't tell us what to do. It said, here's areas where you may be able to improve. And then we went and said, great we can actually restructure our mandatory timeouts to reduce the number of stoppages in play. We can reduce the number of st st coaches, sorry, timeouts that coaches have at the end of games um, to improve the flow of play. So data gave the context for that decision. It didn't make the decision. But there's lots of things that are just much more subjective, uh, and that's where the human element comes in. So anytime we think about on-court rules and what we want the game to look like, you can use data to inform that, and maybe you can use artificial intelligence to simulate what the game might look like if you did X, Y, Z, but that's going to be a much more human conversation among our basketball experts, um, and so it's, it's actually very situational. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I just like, I like information, right? And so, um, you know, analytics is super useful in that it just helps provide more. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily in and of itself better, right? And so, um, one of the, I, I think, for basketball, at least, um, for League of Legends, I'm more. Uh, th there are others in our organization who know much more than me, but I'm still more in the dark. Uh, but for basketball, at least, I think we're at a really cool spot where if you do something great, um, whether you coach great or you uh, uh, you analyze talent great as a scout or you analyze data really really great, um, 
it, those, are, those are pretty equally valuable right now. And so one of the cool things is where basketball is right now, there's not just one way to do it. If you look at the people who are being successful in the NBA, there are a myriad of different approaches. And I actually think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, my, my personal approach is literally to try and do everything really, really well. It's, it's, it's relatively impossible, but that's, that's, I think that's how you end up at the best you can possibly be. And so that's, that's trying to do it and, and not ruling out this or that or, or this and trying to, get, you know, try, you know, trying to get people who are really, really good at it and then hopefully, I like to argue, hopefully get them in a room and start arguing over, over which is which. And I think a lot of times that, that plays out to the best decisions possible. Yeah, I think for us, it's, it's sort of two levels. I think one, Evan used the word context. I think that's, that's a big part of it, which is sort of using data to, to reflect something that people are already seeing or think they're seeing in and around the game. The challenge, the next level for us, the challenge is providing, using data to provide them information that they don't already know. You know, to, for our competition committee, you know, we have to be able to show Mike Tomlin and John Elway something they don't already know. They watch hours and hours and hours of football film. So we can't just go in there and say, hey, you know, offense was really good this year. They're like, well, yeah, we know that. You know, tell me something I don't already know, and that's the challenge for us is to use data to do that. Love it. All right, so we're going to throw to questions from the room that are coming in via our Twitter feed that uh, Sam's curating for us. So this was actually a great segue, um, and I think we've actually covered one of the questions here, which is how do different stakeholders weigh data-driven analysis versus gut feel when making decisions? So I think this was a nice segue um, through that question. Um, here's one. When making a rule change, do you consider what effect that will have on junior leagues and participation in your sport? Yes, is the short answer. Um, we actually just, um, we meet formally, informally, there's lots of conversations between college and pro football. Um, we meet formally with the NCAA every year at the Combine we just did last week. And, and it's a very good open exchange, a reflection on the previous year, um, a sharing of data and information, game data, health and safety data, um, and then a conversation about what we're thinking about changing in the coming year. And it's, it's not always the same thing. It may be the same topics. It may be the punt play or overtime or blindside blocks, things like that. But we may write them differently and go about them differently. Um, but we definitely want to do it um, not in a vacuum. Yes, yeah, the same way. Um, so we're partnering with uh, USA Basketball. We have our junior MBA program. So I think it's two buckets for us. One is making sure that anything we're thinking about uh, is a positive impact on player health, both at the NBA and junior level. Um, the other is just a, a values question, right? Like what are the values of the game that we're trying to teach? How do those permeate into the youth competitions? And are, when, if, we, if and when we change the rule at the NBA level, is that threatening the values that you might want to develop at the youth level? But pretty often those are in sync, so we, we've never had sort of a, a conflict per se, but we absolutely consider it. Do you want to take that one or do you want me to hit another question? Well, we have, like, when you change um, the way our game works, it not only affects pro play and amateur play, but it affects all of us. So we have our gameplay folks are always taking those rules into consideration. When we put rules into place for competitive play, we hope those are going to flow down, but we don't have a uh, ton of formal control over our amateur scene, so it's, it's aspirational. Yep. All right, what might be the next significant rule change in your sports? <laughs> Rafael, what do you got? Crystal ball. I, that is definitely a question for you. <laughs> you would actually know what you're intending to do. <laughs> well, it's, it's no secret we had a replay-related issue this year, so we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll decide whether or not we're, we're going to make any change over the course of the next few months on oh, that one. I can, I can give you one I'd be very interested in. Yeah. I would it. like to shoot one free throw no matter what. Huh. Why so is that? I just, for the, the same reason that, that Evan pointed out earlier, which is that uh, no one likes free throws. So, uh, so given that, uh, I would, you know, one, if you get fouled on a three, it's one free throw for three points. Fouled on a two, it's one free throw for two points. So like I've actually, just, just game speed. I've been on this crusade for, for five years now. I didn't pay him to say this, though. <laughs> um, there's a lot of basketball traditionalists who don't like that idea uh, yeah. for various reasons. Um, but I, I think there may be some legs down the road. It's certainly not something we're going to do soon. Um, I think, we, as we've said, like, our games never look better. So I think we're not looking necessarily to make major changes right now. Um, you know, Kirk Goldsberry gave an interesting presentation today, yesterday. He said, if you like the way the game looks today, you're actually a proponent of change um, because the game is evolving so rapidly and there's, the trends are so exponential that if you want to preserve what's happening now, you may actually need to make changes. Um, so we're starting to think about that 
that style of play question and what we would do, but uh, there, are no, there are no major changes on the horizon right now. Okay, so these next two are, are actually related to the replay. Um, Great. Issue. Okay. <laughs> not, not directly, conceptually. Uh, as fans and even broadcasts have increased the ability to go back and study game tape in slow motion to find refereeing mistakes, how has that changed the league's view toward both rules and refereeing? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's clearly, it's, it's made it more difficult. Um, and I think Al Riveron, who leads our officiating group, uh, the unenviable job of having to do that, will tell you that it's, it's incredibly hard. Um, the technology is forcing us to, to look at the game differently and ask questions about how we officiate it live, via replay. Um, it, doesn't, and it, it doesn't make it any easier. I mean, you take a play like pass interference, and it's easy to say, oh, oh you should be able to change that. But then, then it really forces you to say, okay, well, within the context of that play, when does the interference occur? Is it, you know, when the ball's this far away, this far away, this far away? Like, at what point? And then, and then be able to operationalize it. Like, can you enforce it? And can you enforce it all year long, the 1 o'clock window as well as the Super Bowl? Um, those aren't easy things to do. Um, but the technology is, is sort of forcing us to ask, answer those questions. So if video plus machine learning could be developed to referee perfectly, would the leagues want to eliminate the human element? No. Uh, Manny McCutcheon, who's in the off, uh, audience here, gave a fantastic presentation yesterday here talking about how accuracy is essentially the ante to be a referee, that you, that you need to be able to call a game accurately, but it is not the only component of refereeing, right? The ability to communicate with coaches and players, the ability to manage a game, have situational awareness, um, deal with conflict. Those are critical elements of NBA officiating. Um, so it would be great to have some perfect way to call the game with machine learning. And if we had that, we'd use it, but we would absolutely still have those humans on the floor to manage the game itself. Agreed. How about in the NFL? Agree. Agreed? Wow. All right, here's, uh, here's one more. Um, how do you deal with the rules that have been implemented but have unintended consequence, like the Supermax contract in the NBA? It's just an evolving process. I mean, I'm not, I'm not on the legal side, so luckily I don't have to hear uh, Rafael's complaints about the loopholes, but... Um, they're they're it, not complaints. <laughs> <laughs> they're complaints and we won't let you exploit them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I don't like that. Um, but it's just an evolving process, right? Is, is the minute you notice something that's trending in the direction that, that you maybe didn't want, just go back to the table, have a discussion, see how you could maybe tweak it to, uh, to address the thing that comes up. And to Rafael's point, it's not always easy because there's, there's contracts in place, there's timing of those negotiations, but um, we want to be as flexible and as nimble as possible. All right, that wraps us up. Thank you so much for the conversation. Tremendous.